She has a contusion in her abdominal wall, right upper quadrant, and tenderness there. The patient with a presumed hepatic injury, which of the following uh, characteristics necessitate operative management? Um, so option A, age greater than 55. B, arterial blush on CT. C, grade 4 or 5. D, concomitant spleen injury. Or E, ongoing hemodynamic instability. I I'd pick E. I like that one. Does everyone agree? Okay, let's see. I don't know the answers. Oh, look at that. All right. So, th so this this doesn't uh, this you probably not even get a CAT scan. Uh, this doesn't matter because uh, if the patient's stable, it's all instability. Okay, good. All right. Then let's go to the next question. This is the one I had to look up. I know the movie answer. Who wants to do this? How about uh, uh, Francesca? The first name I can see here. Or somebody want to volunteer? I'll do it. Um, a 70 year old male was walking in his backyard when he was beaten on the left ankle by a rattlesnake. Which of the following is the best immediate treatment? Mm. Wash warm, maybe. Apple proximal tourniquet, no. Make an incision, suction, punctures, and no. Apply eyes and immediate steroid therapy, no. Immobilize the ankle and keep it at the level of the heart or slightly dependent. Um, this is tricky. What do you do with that? Uh, it is tricky. What are you going to go with? This is um, the one I looked up because I wasn't sure. Hey. <laughs> I like that answer because that's in that and the immediate first aid. Uh, tourniquets they don't like because it increased local t tissue damage. Uh, making a decision to suction, that's the movie answer. A lot of jokes around that one, but we don't like want that one. Uh, apply ice and start immediate steroid therapy. That one I don't know. And I don't know if steroids are involved. But uh, And then you're supposed to keep it above your heart level of the heart. So I think I like A. Let's see. Mm. There you go. Yay. And then uh, we don't even have to look up the steroids. I don't know if it's used or not, but uh, it was right. Okay. Very good. Two for two. All right, how about this one? Somebody? First person to speak up? This was in my talk. I can do this one. Okay. So a 34-year-old woman was involved in a snowboarding accident five days ago and since then has been in the ICU receiving aggressive ICP-directed therapy, which event is most likely to cause further brain injury. So this is a second hit with hypotension you want to avoid. Right. Hypotension is number one. Four, 400 times that increases the uh, brain injury. Let's see. Okay. Yep. I studied down at the University of San, uh, California, San Francisco, where... San Francisco General, I guess. Okay. All right. What about this one? I'm happy to do this one. Okay. A 35 year old woman, unrestrained passenger motor vehicle, positive fast in the trauma bay and is taken for emergent X lab. Upon entering the abdomen, evacuating hemoperitoneum, there is active bleeding noted from the right lobe of the liver. After placement of a temporary perihepatic packing, the hemorrhage remains uncontrolled. Clamp the hepatic pedicle, which appears to control the hemorrhage. You're able to visualize a laceration in the liver. What is the next best step? Suture ligation of bleeding vessels within the laceration and a mental packing. Uh, deep suture hepatography of affected parenchyma to approximate the laceration edges. Uh, Placement of vessel loop around the hepatic pedicle, absolutely not. Anatomic <laughs> resection, not necessary. Distillation of proper hepatic artery, no. So I would probably do uh, B as in boy. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think that uh, with, uh, with regard to, uh, and again, I don't know the answers to this, but I think with regard to the hepatic pe pedicle, uh, now that you've proven it's an artery or maybe a branch of the portal vein, 
I think you probably try and look for those vessels and uh, oh, and then yeah. you can stuff it with momentum. But uh, I'm not sure uh, uh, you might not be able to control it with a panatorphic, but that's that's my opinion. So I, I will pick A and see if that's correct. Yeah. So if you have it, and it's good. I'm glad that you asked questions and we gave you know, so it's good to uh, put that out there because it's hard. But that would be certainly the second choice. As you said, absolutely not. You're basically killing the liver that you don't have to do unless you, unless it's already done for you by the thing. And you certainly wouldn't do the proper hepatic. If anything, if they, it's nice they put the proper hepatic in there. If they put the right hepatic, eh, that might be something you might say, well, maybe if I can't see the vessels, maybe I should do that. But uh, I think, you know, obviously that they, they gave you a, choice, a chase here that you might be able to do. So that's good. OK, how about this one? A 14 year old presents to the emergency department after being involved in an MVC. Vitals are stable on exam complaints of abdominal tenderness in the left upper quadrant. CT shows a grade two splenic lack with no active bleeding. Next best step management. Uh, transport in the operating room for splenectomy. No. Um, try to avoid operating in a pediatric patient. Angiography with splenic embolization. Um, there's no active bleeding, so you don't need to do an angiography for an embolization. Observation with serial abdominal exams and serial hemoglobins. That sounds about right, and that's probably what I would pick if it's a grade two with no active X drive. Admit controlled setting, so see. Yeah, that's what I'm going to pick. It's interesting. Uh, they, if it was a grade one, this might be an option. I may consider that with a grade one liver injury and I think that could be an option for liver injury but the spleens I'm always worried because you can have a re-bleed rate of 10 percent per grade uh, just so you know for the splenic embolization if it was a grade four or five this could be the choice uh, it doesn't have to be actively bleeding or have a pseudo -anitor. but you I think this is a choice let's see yep yep you have to be uh you have to be pretty heroic uh maybe kind of foolish to send the girl home so the answer. Okay. Anyone take that on? Looks looks tough to me. A 56-year-old uh, woman was stabbed in the chest and required operative repair of a cardiac injury three days ago. There was no involvement of the coronary vessels in the repair. Today she reported experiencing shortness of breath and chest pain. She was not experiencing this system yesterday. What is the next step of the management? Okay, so she has stabbed on the chest, had a cardiac injury. She's experiencing shortness of breath and chest pain. So we are that her pain is expected. I think uh, it's not a good answer. Obtain a chest X-ray, EKG, and echocardiogram. That could be the best, best next step. Obtain chest, CT, angiography. I don't know about that. Treat her symptoms with morphine. That sounds like a bad idea. Cardiology sounds like a bad idea. So probably I would do B. Yeah, That's I like more. that answer too. I, I would, uh, obviously, A and D are, are silly. and uh, But a C looks pretty tempting also. Uh, so, uh, but you know, you want to make see if she's having a heart attack. So I think an EKG is important. And you, on an echo, you can see uh, you can see a um, blood around the heart. So let's do that. Good job. CT is tempting for anybody, but uh, that's, that's a good first step. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Here's another one. Fifty-six-year-old woman presents to the. I, okay, uh, fifty-six-year-old woman presents to the ED after a high-speed MVC crash uh, involving multiple cars with reports of airbag deployment and significant damage to the vehicle. On arrival, she has stable vital signs and complaints of sternal chest pain on palpation. CT scan of the chest shows a mildly displaced sternal fracture. An EKG shows sinus tack. What is the next? in management. 
Uh, a, discharge home with outpatient follow-up. Uh, no, I would keep her. B, repeat um, EKG in six hours and discharge is stable. C, cardiac cath. No, that's too much. I'm thinking maybe B. Uh, D, troponins and admission to telemetry. Um, yeah, that's all. Yeah, maybe D. And E, urgent transthoracic uh, echocardiogram. Uh, no. So it's kind of, I think D is the answer. It's, I, I would go for D. You're going for B? D, D as a dog. D? D sounds really, uh, like that mm. could be the right answer. The only thing that I remember about troponins is supposedly they're not uh, important in trauma. However, right. yeah. we definitely have troponins that are elevated with someone who has a cardiac contusion. Um, and so watching them for 24 hours, so that's, uh, I don't know, B, I don't know if B is the right answer. It's between B and D for me. B and D, yeah, exactly. So what, what, what should we go? I'll pick your answer and see what we got. Okay. Good job. Oh, yeah. All right, great. I think the most important thing in there is uh, admitting for 24 hours and watching it uh, because she does have sinus tachycardia as opposed to just a normal sinus rhythm. Um, but, uh, you know, the troponins is controversial, but it does get elevated with uh, trauma patients. So it's a good answer. You see that one on the test? That's what you pick. Okay. A uh, 28 year old man presents after being stabbed multiple times in the abdomen on physical exam. Uh, noted to have a laceration of the omentum and is taken to the OR for X lab. Found to have one centimeter cerebral injury in the proximal jejunum and a two centimeter uh, full thickness laceration to uh, the proximal ileum, involving 75% of the circumference and extending into the mesentery. Uh, the man remains hemodynamically stable. What's the most appropriate option for the pair of this injury? Um, primary pair of both, uh, jejunum and oem. Uh, I don't think so. If more than 50%, uh, you should not do primary pair. And the second, the second injury is 75%. Uh, primary pair of the jejunum and segmental resection and the anastomosis of the ileum. That sounds right. Segmental resection and anastomosis of both injuries. Of jejunum and primary per, no uh, of the jejunum and primary part of the ileum no segmental resection of both no segmental resection of both leaving discontinuity he's a, he's a stable so we can do definitive repair so I'll go with uh, uh, B as in boy okay he's a he's a he's a answer if you want to do more billing but uh, B is the is the answer that's a good Okay, yeah, so obviously it's, a, it's having it more than 50% and that means you have to do a resection. Good. Okay. Who wants this one? All right, I'll do it. A 45-year-old female with history of neck radiation for lymphoma presents home after hemoptysis earlier in the day. She had undergone a tracheostomy five weeks earlier for severe pneumonia. During an attempted tracheobronchoscopy, the patient begins coughing with immediate large volume hemoptysis obscuring the visual field. Which of the following is the definitive management of this complication? Um, a perform a translaryngeal intubation past the side of hemorrhage, place a tracheal stent across the side of hemorrhage, perform a tissue interposition between the trachea and esophagus, perform a partial sternotomy and resection of the innominate artery, perform a left thoracotomy with aorta clamping. Um, so I think this is a tracheal innominate fistula and the definitive management, um, I would think is D, perform sternot sternotomy and resection of the innominate artery. Yeah, I think that uh, you got obviously fix the hole in the artery, so I think that looks like the best answer. A stent will do that, and uh, and uh, you know, uh, yeah, you, you would do it into position once you possibly fix the artery between the trachea and the artery, but not the 
So an aortic clamping is not going to do anything at something that high up. So we'll go with D here. OK, I think uh, acutely. Uh, um, as it said, definitive treatment, which is good. It's nice to read the question because you might say, well, acutely, maybe I should intubate past the site of hemorrhage and then put your finger in there, which is what you would do acutely. Um, but it's definitive management, so good. And uh, probably a lot of you have scores, so you can find the explanations on score there. Um, <clears throat> who's got this one? Oh, this one. Uh, your trauma surgery attending asks you to consent one of your patients for urgent wound exploration and possible limb amputation. Prior to speaking with the patient, you calculate his mangled extremity severity score or mass so that you can advise him as to likelihood of amputation, at which mass is a limb traditionally considered unsalvageable and will likely require amputation. Um, that's a score of seven or greater, so D as in dog. I think that's right. It's on my uh, lecture. We didn't go over that slide because it was at the very end. But I think that it is correct. It's a pure memory uh, answer. Yep, very good. Very good. But it's on the lecture, so hopefully they got that resource. OK. A 57-year-old man sustains a gunshot wound to the left chest. He presents in a delayed fashion. Uh, hemodynamic is stable. Images reveals intrathoracic perforation of the distal esophagus. You explore the patient via left thoracotomy and attempt repair, but you know that the esophageal tissue around the perforation is friable and will not hold sutures. Uh, 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 the rest of the esophagus appears healthy. The defect is relatively small. What should you do? Um, Place a large T tube to create a controlled fistula, esophagectomy with cervical esophagostomy. I don't think so. Uh, esophagectomy with colon interposition. Also, I don't think so. Continue attempts at primary care. I don't think so. I'll go the first one. Yeah, this, uh, this looks like uh, this is pretty tough. Obviously, C and D. I have seen someone uh, do uh, B. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's kind of aggressive on this thing. So you don't necessarily want to leave a, con a continue to hold there, but we'll, we'll pick a. Yep. And then it possibly could do something later on. OK. Maybe have a. Uh, be able to move the esophagus to a point since it's small. If it was a huge hole, you might have to uh, think about resecting it. OK. Poor vessel cabbage and awakens with weakness in a right hand. Do you suspect brachial plexus injury? Which factor may have contributed to this person's brachial plexus injury during surgery? Um, <clears throat> I would go with A. I think so. Yep. Positioning is important. Interesting they put this in a trauma lecture. This one. I can do it. 26 year old man shot in the right thigh following an altercation. After a wound exploration and temporary shunting, he's found to have a femoral artery transection. After the, bre the breeding, the artery of damaged vasculature, it cannot be closed in an end to end fashion, which is the preferred conduit for bypass. I think it's um, A, contralateral great up in his vein. That's what I've always heard. The, the uh, E is interesting, but that's what I've always heard. Yep. 
They say a cephalic vein is avoided. It's more difficult to harvest. There you go. Okay. What do you guys say? Who wants it? The patient arrives with an expanding hematoma of the right neck following a stab wound. Uh, GCS is 15. Uh, her neurological exam is non-focal. She has multiple other wounds and is hemodynamically unstable. On exploration of the neck, there is complete transection of the external carotid artery. What is the best management of her external carotid artery injury? injury? Um, primary repair, ligation, shunt, uh, repair with an interposition graft or a PTFE an interposition graft. Um, in that case, she's unstable, so I would choose B, ligation of the vessel. Yeah, no, no issues there. It should be the answer. Who cares about this? I've had to do this. That found out it was the internal carotid. Anyway, that was a ton from a, a complication of massive bleeding from a tonsillectomy. Okay. A 33-year-old man presents to the trauma bay after his leg is run over by a tractor trailer. On presentation, his airway and breathing are intact, uh, and his vital signs are stable and within normal limits. Your examination reveals no open wound or gross bone deformity, but you do note a non-expanding popliteal hematoma. His ankle brachial in injury, uh, sorry, index on the injured limb is 0 0.85. What is the most appropriate next step in management? A plain film imaging of the tibia. Uh, fibula and knee joint, B, ultrasound of the lower extremity, uh, C, observation and neurovascular checks on the floor, D, CT and geography, E, immediate operative exploration. So I think he has soft signs. Um, and the next thing I would do immediately would be to make sure there's no fractures. So I would actually just get plain film. See if we can reduce them. Yeah, I don't think that's necessarily a bad answer. Uh... Uh, but he does have a lower ankle brachial index, which would suggest that he has a popliteal injury. I think uh, I think that when the appropriate next step is kind of interesting. He's going to have to end up with a CT angiography. I agree. Um, Thank you. So I think that maybe uh, I would choose that, but we can choose this one and see. Might be the right answer. CT angiography, yeah. I think eventually it's that 85%. If he had, if he had uh, 0 0.85, if it was one or above 0 0.9, then uh, you could say that, you know, okay, we might have to do an evaluation because it's of proximity like they used to do in the old days. And then you have to get your injuries and stuff. But I think that uh, the CT angiography is probably the best answer. Okay. You want this one? Sure. A 74 year old woman presents after falling down a flight of stairs. Her vitals are heart rate of 78 beats per minute, blood pressure of 115 over 75, respiratory rate of 22 breaths per minute, and oxygen saturation of 93% on four liters of nasal cannula. She's found to have a pulmonary contusion on her left side with five rib fractures. What, which of the following is most likely to help her avoid pulmonary failure and mechanical ventilation? Um, and in this case, I would say epidural an analgesia. That's what we do. There, there are people that will put a, a catheter in along the ribs and, and do an intercostal nerve blockade, but it would have to be a catheter. Just doing five, doing five ribs must be kind of hard individually, especially if you're, you know, so I think we'd have to say that. So I like this answer. Very good. I think that the, uh, you know, when, uh, you know, the, uh, the catheter that, that kind of milks so you, when you do a big laparotomy or something like that. Uh, they've done that for trauma and, and rib fractures, but I don't hear it uh, talk about that much. So it's probably not as, as popular as it used to be, which wasn't that popular to begin with. Who wants to do this one?
I can do that one. 42 year old man presented to the emergency department after a motorcycle crash with an obvious deformity and shortening of the left thigh. To fully characterize the etiology of the deformity, which radiograph is more appropriate? So, usually you tend to x ray the joint below and after the injury that you're concerned. So, in this case, I will probably go with D. D Elvis. Sounds good to me because, uh, yeah, with well, the obvious deformity, he's got to have a femur fracture. But uh, he probably, with the with the uh, shortening, you think that he has something in his femoral neck or or his, his joint up at the hip. So, uh, so that should be the answer, I think. Huh? Okay. Gunshot wound the abdomen. Someone's gonna want that. A 22-year-old woman presents after a gunshot wound to the abdomen. Vitals are uh, temperature 35, uh, heart rate 130, blood pressure 80 over 60, uh, respiratory rate of 20, uh, saturation of 95 until later near the cannula. Resuscitation with blood is initiated, and she's taken to the OR for laparotomy. Bleeding from the liver is identified and controlled, and laceration of the pillar of the pancreas is identified. During the case, uh, clinical status declines, and she requires multiple beta pressors. And uh, her latest ABG with a pH of 7.2, in addition to temporary abdominal closure, which of the following is the best um, next step in the operation. Drain placement uh, near the pancreas, distal tank, uh, feeding digenostomy. Whipple uh, uh, ERCP. Uh, so we're doing uh, damage control. Uh, I'll drain here for now and then come back later. Sounds good to me. Drain, drain, drain. I'm not going to do any more surgery. You got to get out and you can do it. You can take it. You're going to come back. So you can take the pancreas out then. And that would be a distal pancreatectomy. I would get some imaging beforehand to see exactly as you can see if there's an injury to the duct or not. Okay. Oh, is it the same question? Oh, sorry. I'm moving along here. A 23-year-old man is shot in the abdomen and is taken to the operating room for emergent exploration. He's found to have left ureteral transection injury just distal to the iliac vessels. Debridement confirms a two-centimeter ureteral defect. Which ureteral repair is indicated in this scenario? Uh, a is ureteral ureterostomy, dis dismembered pyeloplasty, bovary flap, ureteral neocystostomy, or ileal interposition. Um, I am thinking between, uh, the defect is two centimeters. It's a low defect. It's a tough one. I'm not even sure what a dismembered pyloplasty is, but, uh, mm -hmm. I know you're probably thinking between C and D, right? Yeah. It depends on how close you are to the bladder, I think, right? And if, mm -hmm. if it's a bladder hitch, it might make it more uh, attractive, but uh, it must be pretty close to that bladder. So we'll see D. Yeah, I don't know. What do people say out there? C or D? B. D. All right, we'll go with it. Good job. I think it had to be more uh, proximal uh, to be the, to use the. Uh, the already flat. And I think once it said it was below the uh, iliac arteries, that would have basically what it's saying. If you have to do a bladder hitch, that's fine. But you're just put, putting it back in the bladder. <clears throat> okay. An elderly woman brought to the uh, trauma bay after fall from standing. 
has several broken ribs on the chest x-ray, but quickly develops no oxygen requirement. How can you quickly determine if the patient has no thorax? Uh, it's typically a scurvy linear transducer and the intercostal space uh, D. Which one did you pick? D as in dog. D as in dog. Yeah. That's what I like. Okay. Yeah. That's what it's going to be up on top, right? Okay. Forty-two-year-old man sustains blunt trauma to the abdomen. He is hemodynamically normal and arrival to the hospital. And, compu and computer tomography of the abdomen and pelvis demonstrates a grade two liver laceration and a duodenal hematoma with dilation of the stomach. How would you manage this patient? Um, a. Perform exploratory laparotomy, thermocoagulation, or suture hepatography, uh, hepatography sorry, of the liver injury and surgical decompression of the duodenal hematoma. B, perform a uh, diagnostic laparoscopy to evaluate the liver and duodenal injuries. C, uh, perform exploratory laparotomy with thermal coagulation and suture hepatography of the liver injury, place a decompressive nasogastric tube proximal to the duodenal hematoma and start total for internal nutrition. D, place a decompressive nasogastric uh, tube, initiate total for internal nutrition and obtain serial complete blood counts. And E, perform exploratory laparotomy, thermal coagulation, uh, or suture hepatography of the liver injury and gastrojejunostomy bypass of the duodenal hematoma. Um, I think for this one, I would choose D. Yeah, so I think this one is well, if you already decided that the patient is hemodynamically stable and you don't see uh, any any uh, perforation of a uh, hollow viscous and the liver injury is minor, you've already decided not, I think you probably already decided not to operate on the patient. So. Luckily, it's making it kind of easy because it, everything else is an operation. So I think yeah, that's the answer. I think if you haven't entered the abdomen, there's no real reason to explore the hematoma. Right. So I think that's good. You know, then they, the question will come up is how long you let that hematoma go. And if there's some issues about a week or so, and I don't know, probably probably have to think of doing something. But uh, acutely, obviously, that's the answer for a duty of hematoma. Okay. A 32-year-old man presents to the ED after multiple GSWs to the lower abdomen. He's hemodynamically stable on arrival at the trauma bay. Rectal exam reveals blood. CT with uh, oral IV and rectal contrast is inconclusive for rectal injuries. He's taken to the operating room. What additional studies may be performed to evaluate the patient for a rectal injury? Um, a, no further workup, uh, rigid procto, tap water enema, and repeat CT, repeat CT, or colonoscopy. Uh, I would do B, rigid proctoscopy. That's, that's what I would do. I'm pretty old, though. How many people have done that? I can't see you raise your hand. So I've done know. it. I've done quite a few. <laughs> okay, very good. That's the answer. And it's the answer uh, if you you know you don't have time to get a CT. That's just the answer for gunshot wounds that you take to the that you take to the operating room. I suppose uh, if the patient's stable and you got a pelvic gunshot wound and you, they don't have gross hematuria and their blood vessels are okay and things like that, uh, I would probably still want to image, look in the rectum, but uh, maybe a CT is good enough. But I don't know. I think it's the answer. Okay. A 52-year-old man presents in the emergency department after a fall from 10 feet, which he injured his left leg. He is found to have a left posterior knee dislocation and no palpable pulses in his left foot. The joint is relocated and the leg brought back out to length, and now Doppler signals are present in the foot. ABIs are performed under 0.7. What's the next best step in management? A, admit for observation pulse checks. B, start a heparin grip. C, obtain a CT and gel at the left lower extremity. D, proceed to the OR for immediate left popliteal artery exploration or E, discharge home after follow-up and uh, vascular surgery in two weeks. Um, with the diminished uh, ABI, I would P. 
pick answer choice C. That's what I do. Sometimes some, some uh, yeah, the other question is, does he need just an immediate exploration? You know, his blunt trauma and his pulse did come back. If he had no pulse and that was the only injury along his uh, the course of his vessels, he might be able to say C. I mean, D, but I think uh, the fact that he got a pulse back, you want to see if it's something they could treat with a stent. So I think that's got to be the answer. But don't be afraid to, uh, if someone has no pulse, that uh, the operation might, when you get your choices, the operation might be the choice to pick when you have no pulse and you know the proximity of the injury where the fracture is. Um, you know, how many people would actually do that uh, when they can do it unless the patient is unstable? If they're stable, I think everyone is going to want to get a, a CTA, CTA. But that could still, that, that is an answer that can be considered. Certainly, penetrating trauma uh, with, a, a, you know, obviously, and that's impulse. You, you don't do a CTA, you just go where the bullet is. Okay. Uh oh, orthopedic one. Wants to do this. I always get this wrong, but I'll give it a try. Um, a 19 year old woman presents with inability to flex her right ring finger at the distal interphalangeal joint after injuring her hand while playing basketball two weeks ago. She can flex the finger at the proximal interphalangeal joint, and there is no evidence of a skin laceration. X rays reveal no fracture or dislocation. What structure is injured? A, flexor digitorum profundus tendon, uh, B, volar plate of the distal interphalangeal joint, C, central slip, that's no, D, flexor digitorum superficialis tendon, and E, palmar interosseous muscle. So I'm between A, uh, digitorum profundus and D, between the profundus or the superficialis, and it's her last, the distal one. So I think it's the profundus. I'll go with A. Yeah, it's definitely that. It's definitely that muscle, and uh, that muscle. Uh, the thing about the central slip is that that muscle. Uh, I mean, the uh, tendon is 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 the uh, sort of the central slip, but uh, oh, but it's definitely that tendon. It depends on where it's injured, you know. Yeah. So it's a, a okay. We'll go with it. <laughs> Let's try it. Yep, you got oh, it. Yes, okay, great. <laughs> All right. So here's another one. Who is this orthopedic stuff? Twenty-year-old female college basketball player is being evaluated after jamming her extended uh, finger while playing basketball. On evaluation, she is able to actively extend and flex uh, the proximal interphalangeal joint uh, with uh, PIP joint holding 90 degrees over the edge of the table. Her distal interphalangeal joint demonstrates extension while the middle phalanx is held in place. What type of injury has occurred and which structure is affected? So she's able to actively extend and flex the proximal. Um, but uh, her distal is held in extension. OK, uh, flexor injury, flexor digitorum profundus. Uh, extensor injury, extensor digitorum profundus. Flexor injury, flexor digitorum superficialis. Extensor injury, lateral bands. Extensor injury, uh, triangular ligaments. So she's able to actively extend and flex the proximal. So that means superficialis is in, uh, flexor superficialis is intact. Um, I, I personally am having trouble reading so the question because I'm not sure exactly what's injured. Yeah. 
because she can extend her proximal phalanx. She can extend her distal phalanx, right? Yeah. What what can she not do? Am I missing something? I think she cannot flex the the distal, the distal phalanx. Which is uh, gonna be the same thing. Uh, flexor injury the profundus, I guess. Okay. It's like a thousand ways of asking not sure, the question. Doesn't you want this one? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I get. I, well, I I couldn't understand exactly what was the injury the way they were asking the question. Um, because it said she could extend her her. Uh, She could extend her, doesn't it say that? Extension. So anyway, you read the answer here. Somebody on you know, anyway. I guess I guess she couldn't extend it unless she had the the uh, PUP joint 90 degrees over the edge of the table. And and then uh but she couldn't extend it if you had a straight. I guess that's what it's saying. It just I don't I don't think it's a very I, I was confused like you. You were assuming that she had a flexor injury. Um, it's a bad question. I've heard that maybe 2% of them are thrown out, so maybe that was one of them that should be thrown out. Or one of your orth orthopedic experts out there probably could explain it to me. Anyway, here's another one. Twenty-three-year-old male presents to the emergency department with a penetrating wound on the right shoulder, which he received during the scaffolding collapse. On arrival, he noted that they have a single wound on the right anterior chest, just medial to the shoulder. He also has an abrasion on the forehead. Vital signs emerged at high rate of 115 and blood pressure of 1 over 100 over 80. He's confused from revelation of his vital signs. The man's heart rate is now 130 and his blood pressure is 70 over 30. And chest radiograph is obtained. And blood transfusion is initiated. What is the best next step? So it's really difficult to see that X ray, but it looks oh, like. Yeah. There you go. So I guess he looks like he's got some blood in his chest, huh? Yeah, it looks like a wide out. And the options are complete secondary survey, right or academy, perform in the operating room, placement in a right uh, tube, which is probably the right answer. CT is never a good answer in a patient hypotensive. Right needle thoracostomy. This will maybe be the good answer if it's like a tension in my thorax and want to evacuate, but I would think B as in boy would be the. You want to do a thoracotomy? Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. C as in placement of a right tube thoracostomy. Yeah, I think that's what you want because I, I can't see a pneumo. Definitely has a hemo. Yeah. Um, I guess we're assuming that he has a subclavian injury, right? Yes. Um, so eventually you're going to have to get there. But uh, the next step, uh, you know, hopefully they've already done their secondary survey. That would be the next step. But uh, um, yeah, you'd want to see how much blood is in there, although it could make him worse. Uh, but I think that's got to be the answer, I think. So let's see. He's on an arrest now, so I don't think he would do a, a thoracotomy right away. And, and in any case, control of the proximal subclavian artery probably is better controlled on the right side with a uh, with a uh, sternotomy. So there you go. So then uh, I guess you take him to the operating room and, and uh, your uh, you know, you and your vascular surgeon would probably try and figure out the, how the best way to approach it. If he remains totally unstable, starts to bleed out of his chest, you're just going to have to cut down on that that hole. And uh, it might be, depending on how distal it is, you might just have to uh, attack it directly and see if you can clamp it. Otherwise, you'll have to consider a sternotomy. Um, I know that if you can keep the patient somewhat stable, um, they uh, have, you know, they've approached the brachial order and see if they can get a, 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 a stent across it while they're trying to figure out how to repair it. So anyway, 
or or you know put a basically do a, a put a balloon on approximately and control it that way. So it's different options that way. Well, so Clavin injuries are one of the hardest uh, ones to uh, attack. Oh, here's a spider question. Brown recluse. Forty-one-year-old male presents after reported being bitten by a brown recluse. Um, thinks when thought to give a thought to potential complications, you consider which of the following. Um, I think it's coagulation, like coagulopathy. Uh, the brown recluse can cause issues, but um, uh, I thought it was only local stuff. Local, what can I remember? Muscle fasciculations. Hmm. It's just a recall question on associations with uh, recluse bites. Which one do you want to pick? Hmm. Do you question? I, th I thought coagulation, but um, I don't think it'll cause autonomic instability. No, I don't think so. And I don't know if it would cause this. Rigidity, I don't think it would cause that either. So I'd pick like coagulation. I'm not really sure how bad muscle fasciculations are. Right. <laughs> Same. But I'm not sure, you know, this makes me think more like a snake, you know, and this this stuff uh more like a a uh, you know black widow type thing or maybe a scorpion. But uh I don't know you know, why they just say, you know, don't wound a wound agreement. But uh What does the what does the gallery say? What do, you, what do people say out there? What do they like? I say A two. A Hey. All right, let's go. There you go. I haven't seen too much of that. I've had a lot of brown recluses, especially living down in Tennessee, but uh, usually the patients do pretty good, except for local problems. <clears> hey. <throat> okay. You're consulted on an 18 month old girl who has suspected non accidental trauma in addition to multiple scattered ecchymosis and abrasions. You know that she is unable to extend her right wrist. Uh, strength and range of motion in the arm are otherwise normal. What is most likely the mechanism of the underlying injury? Severely displaced clavicular fracture, uh, anterior shoulder dislocation, spiral fracture of the humerus, radial head subluxation, and a traumatic compression of the carpal tunnel. Um, so it sounds like so she can't extend the wrist. Uh, initially, I was thinking it sounded like a nursemaid's elbow with a radial head subluxation. Um, but you would think that would be more an elbow issue, right? Elbow, yeah. Um, maybe a traumatic compression of the carpal tunnel would be my next thought. I don't think it's a clavicle or a shoulder dislocation. but Yeah, the strength and range of motion of the right arm, you would think that, you know, obviously she could get a radial nerve. Uh, and and she might uh, have a humerus fracture, but you don't think she would be able to move her right arm. Right, she uh, had opposites. Uh, but carpal tunnel, you would think that'd be mm -hmm. more flexion. Yeah, and so it would be, uh, it would be, uh, and it would be more of her fingers. So I don't know. Yeah, the, humerus, the spiral humerus with the getting the radial higher. Yeah, I think I was thinking the spiral. Uh, you know, the other ones they're throwing in there. Dislocation, you don't think she'd be able to, I don't know if she'd be able to move arm with her humerus fractured either. Um, I can't imagine uh, getting the brachial plexus with a clavicle fracture. Obviously, we're worried about um, abuse here and then maybe spot fractures of the long bones. What do, they, what do people want to pick? The radial nevrons in the spiral groove at the back of the humerus. I'd say C. And then this could be, uh, it could be, uh, I guess oh. you could get your ulnar nerve here, right? But okay, we'll go with C. Good job. That's what we liked. Tough question. 
Let's get away from orthopedics. <laughs> All right, second to last, and I'll finish them up. For your old woman who is 35 weeks pregnant with an after a fall down uh, a flight of stairs, she is uh, reporting uh, right hip pain, abdominal pain, right hip pain, initial vitals, uh, heart rate of 118, blood pressure 105 over 80, respiration 26, at that uh, 98 on room air. She's noted to have a cast on her uh, left forearm and multiple cold bruises, uh, which she states are from fall that occurred about a week ago. When questioned further, she states that she has become clumsy due to a protuberant uh, abdomen, which statement best describes appropriate assessment and plan for this patient. You suspect the patient may be suffering domestic abuse. I think that's right. However, because she's not willing to admit it, you are not obligated to report it. Uh, so this x-ray uh, does not need to be obtained during the initial survey as you plan to obtain a CT scan of the abdomen or in a scan of pregnant ladies. Um, and there is no um, obligation to uh, fast examination replaces uh, the normal fast exam in pregnant uh, patients. Uh, abdominal pelvic MRI should be obtained in lieu of CT scan, uh, given the patient recent release and exposure and cumulative release and dose, the patient should undergo CT scan at that point. Um, what do you want? Uh, I think it's A. You want A? So uh, for 35 weeks, if you, if, I don't know what they want to focus on the, on the injury she might have, like the hip pain. You didn't know if she has anything in there. Um, certainly, at 35 weeks, you can radiate uh, her if you need to. Um, or they're trying to say that she's got all these multiple bruises and then she's being abused. Um, but you, you technically can't report it if she's not willing to have you report it. So what do people want out there? A. Okay, so e. what? E. You want e? E. 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 Yeah, because right. I can scan them. E. Yeah, e. There you go. Yeah, because at, uh, at 35 weeks, it's okay. Okay, and then the last question. We just get one answer. Uh, who want? What do we want to pick on this one? Uh, okay. You all guys, you, you guys can. Uh, I'll go with E. You want the E? C. C. Which one are going? D. Okay. D. Well, it's only five years. Do, 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 do. Yep. Which one do you want? This one? D. Yeah, let's go D. There you go. All right. Very good. I think that's uh, quite enough. That's a whole hour. You guys uh, enjoyed it. Those are the kind of things you're going to see. Because you got to know your, uh, your orthopedic... Uh, Stuff because every time I pick questions, there's always some orthopedic stuff on there. But uh, for the most part, I think everyone did great. So uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Doctor. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Dr. Thank you. Dr. Thank you.